Through the Middle Ages, the men who loved the Bible and believed it to be the very Word of God struggled for centuries to see the sacred scripture translated into the languages of the common people. In England, the great climax of their effort was the publication of the King James Bible in 1611. But nearly 300 years later, what was known as the Authorized Version would be dramatically revised by a committee of English scholars as a result of the discovery of the Codex Sinaiticus in 1859 and with it, the publication of the Vatican's Greek Bible, known as the Codex Vaticanus. In 1870, a revision committee came together, led by two scholars named Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort. These men were determined not only to revise the English words of the authorized version, but also the underlying Greek text. In the century that would follow, the changes they made and the reasons they made them would spark some of the sharpest controversies in the modern church. Because they perpetrate the lie that the Vatican manuscript, the Sinai manuscript are the oldest and the best. They also formulated the theory that the churches throughout all these centuries had a corrupt text of scripture and that only now could the pure text of scripture be recovered primarily because of the discovery of Vaticanus and the discovery of Sinaiticus. And of course, if, if those two manuscripts are not sound, their entire theory is gone. These men were, were I think, liberals and apostates, and they had more to do with changing the world for the wrong Greek text of any other two, any other man before them. The work of Westcott and Hort was opposed by 19th century British scholar, Dean John Bergen. After studying their revised version of the Bible, he confronted their changes in his own work titled, The Revision Revised. Bergen wrote that the revision of 1881 was inaccurate and said it exhibits defective scholarship in countless places. He openly declared that Westcott and Hort had created a new Greek text. Bergen wrote that, It is the systematic deprivation of the underlying Greek which does so grievously offend me. For this is nothing else but a poisoning of the river of life and its sacred source. Our revisers, with the best and purest intentions, no doubt, stand convicted of having deliberately rejected the words of inspiration in every page, and of having substituted for them fabricated readings which the Church has long since refused to acknowledge, or else has rejected with abhorrence, and which only survive at this time in a little handful of documents of the most depraved type. The theory of Westcott and Hort was that the greater body of Bible manuscripts, which number in the thousands, were somehow corrupt, and that the more accurate readings were to be found in just a few copies that were supposedly older and more reliable. Westcott and Hort's contribution was that they were able to academically build a theory which allowed them to ignore 95% of the manuscript evidence so that they could create the, the Greek New Testament that they used in 1881. As a result, Dean John Bergen would declare that the revision of 1881 must come to be universally regarded as what it most certainly is, the most astonishing, as well as the most calamitous literary blunder of the age. Another scholar, F.H.A. Scrivener served on the committee with Westcott and Hort. He voiced many objections to their theory and their conclusions. In the end, he was so troubled by their work that he eventually published his own rebuttal. He said, Dr. Hort's system is entirely destitute of historical foundation. We are compelled to repeat as emphatically as ever our strong conviction that the hypothesis to whose proof he has devoted so many laborious years is destitute not only of historical foundation, but of all probability. Westcott and Hort uh, coming to the forefront, they 
uh, clandestinely, secretly put together this new Greek text that's based on the corrupt text of the Vatican, that's based on the corrupt text of Sinai, and, and is based really on, you, you go back to Griesbach, they use Griesbach's Unitarian text as well. Johann Jacob Griesbach was a 19th century German scholar who is often called the father of modern textual criticism. Westcott and Hort declared that the name of Griesbach was, quote, a name we venerate above that of every other textual critic of the New Testament. Scrivener wrote that their new textual theory was built upon the thinking of Griesbach as well as other textual critics who presented alternative views to the traditional Greek text. The germ of this theory can be traced in the speculations of Bentley and Griesbach. But there is little hope for the stability of their imposing structure if its foundations have been laid on the sandy ground of ingenious conjecture. The conjecture Scrivener referred to had to do with the theory of Dr. Hort, who claimed that sometime between 250 and 350 AD, the original texts of the Bible were deliberately altered by certain church leaders at Antioch in ancient Syria. This was supposedly followed by a second revision that took place later on. During these revisions, words and verses were supposedly added to the Bible and resulted in the longer readings which are found in the Textus Receptus, or the traditional text used by the Reformers. Hort argued that Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus contained shorter readings overall because they had not been contaminated by this alleged revision process at Antioch. Scrivener argued that Hort's theory was completely imaginary. Of this twofold authoritative revision of the Greek text, not one trace remains in the history of Christian antiquity. He doesn't give a reference, a quotation from anybody operating at that period of time. He just theorizes, and because he theorizes, it's true. And then, you see, they said when they had this in 250, 350 AD, which is false, there was no such convocation, no historical evidence. Dean Borgon says, if this were such a, a tremendous occurring uh, and happenstance, they would have in papers and autobiographies and records and historical books, there's nothing about that. Dean Bergen also argued that Westcott and Hort defied the original instructions for the revision, which required that they abstain from all but necessary changes. He further claimed that they had secretly introduced their new Greek text to form the foundation for the new revision. I traced the mischief home to its true authors, Drs. Westcott and Hort, a copy of whose unpublished text of the New Testament the most vicious in existence had been confidentially and under pledges of the strictest secrecy placed in the hands of every member of the revising body. What they did was to put up into the hands of every one of these revisers, he put in their hands a different text, their text that they'd been working on for 11 years. And they said now under no conditions, no circumstances, will any of you men on this committee tell anybody you got a different Greek text. They foisted it upon in secret. According to Dean Bergen, Westcott and Hort had already created their new Greek text and then began to convince the committee to accept it. Hort himself is said to have been the decisive leader in promoting the historical theory behind it. Bergen writes, The revisionists had, in an evil hour, surrendered themselves to Dr. Hort's guidance. Yet the question remains, why would Hort develop such an implausible theory and then insist upon using it to alter the original Greek text of the New Testament? Some believe the answer is found in a letter he wrote as a young scholar. He made the statement at the age of 23 in 1851. He wrote to a friend. He said, I had no idea till the last few weeks of the importance of texts. Having read so little Greek Testament and dragged on with the villainous 
Texas Receptus. Think of that vile Texas Receptus leaning entirely on late manuscripts. That's where we begin. And he just held to that throughout his life. 23 years old, hadn't read much Greek Testament, comes to that. I think you can see an enemy hath done this, to use a quote from Mark. And the parable of the, the parable of the wheat and tares, an enemy hath done this. But why did Dr. Hort hold to such a hostile view of the traditional Greek text? And was he really an enemy of the Bible? After Westcott and Hort died, their private letters were published and shed light on some of their beliefs. Hort appears to have kept his own doctrinal views secret while working with Westcott on the New Greek text, fearing that it might be rejected because of his heretical views. Writing to Westcott in 1861, Hort said, Also, but this may be cowardice, I have a sort of craving that our text should be cast upon the world before we deal with matters likely to brand us with suspicion. I mean, a text issued by men already known for what will undoubtedly be treated as dangerous heresy will have great difficulty in finding its way into regions which it might otherwise hope to reach. Of course, I felt this doubt all along, but made it give way to the necessities of our joint plan. The Joint Plan was a series of essays they intended to publish, which Dr. Hort believed would reveal their unorthodox views. Westcott and Hort were, were very symbolic of a movement in the Church of England that was not Protestant in its sympathy. It was not evangelical. It did not represent anything that the better part of the Church of England represented. To understand the historic context of their writings, it is important to know the environment that Westcott and Hort lived in in the 19th century. It was an era driven by what was known as the Oxford Movement. Well, the Oxford Movement was primarily to bring the Anglican Church, if at all possible, back under the authority of Rome. The Oxford Movement was a 19th century manifestation of the Jesuits' Counter-Reformation. In 1850, historian Thomas Carlyle referred to this era as the age of Jesuitism. He went on to describe the wretched mortal known among men as Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order dedicated to overturning the Protestant Reformation. Carlyle said, to me, he seems historically definable. He, more than another, as the poison fountain from which these rivers of bitterness that now submerge the world have flowed. During the Oxford movement, the Jesuits and Romanists were believed to have infiltrated Protestant churches throughout England. This political cartoon from 1850 shows Pope Pius IX, along with Cardinal Wiseman, attempting to break into a church. The Anglo-Catholics were known as ritualists and Tractarians. Some of their teachings about the Bible are described in the book, The Secret History of the Oxford Movement by Walter Walsh. They staunchly oppose the Protestant doctrine of sola scriptura, meaning by scripture alone. Against this, the ritualists taught that the Bible is not the sole and only rule of faith. They further declared nor is it any infringement of the reverence due to the Bible to declare openly and distinctly that Bible Christianity is an invention of the devil. And our blessed Lord did not intend any written document to be the basis of the faith he founded. Perhaps most significantly, they said, if a man's faith is pinned to a document and that document be proved to have flaws in it. Away goes his faith. 
One of the major members of that uh, Oxford movement was John Newman. Newman was the major writer of the tracts that appeared at that time in an attempt to gradually influence the Anglicans to come back under the authority of Rome. They were fairly successful. They had 150 men who came then back under the authority of Rome. In his writings, Hort often wrote about John Henry Newman. Newman had been an Anglican minister who initially preached against Rome, but then gradually began to preach in its favor until he finally converted and became a Catholic priest. Hort comments on Newman with both criticism and admiration. He once said, You must have misunderstood me about Newman. Many of his sayings and doings I cannot but condemn most strongly, but they are not Newman, and him I all but worship. Few men have been privileged to be the authors of such incalculable blessings to the world. When speaking about another author, Hort wrote, The leading man is Dr. Nevin. I can compare him to no one but Newman, and higher praise it would be difficult to give. Once, when writing to Westcott, he said, The perfect clearness and keenness of Newman always gives me pleasure. In some places, Hort seems to be critical of Newman's turn towards Rome, but then, in a letter to Mr. John Ellerton in the year 1848, Hort would write that, The pure Romish view seems to me nearer and more likely to lead to the truth than the evangelical. Hort even went so far as to speak favorably about the worship of Mary and the idea of Mary as co-mediator with Christ. I have been persuaded for many years that Mary worship and Jesus worship have very much in common in their causes and their results. Perhaps the whole question may be said to be involved in the true idea of mediation. We condemn all secondary human mediators as injurious to the one. But this last error can hardly be expelled till Protestants unlearn the crazy horror of the idea of priesthood. Elsewhere, Hort confessed himself to be a staunch sacerdotalist. Sacerdotalism is the belief that a priest is necessary to act as a mediator between the people and God. Yet in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul declared plainly, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Faith in Christ as the sole mediator, rather than in Mary or a Catholic priest, is the central difference between the Bible-based Protestant faith and the religion of Rome. As the great theologian Shedd said, Christ has done away with the priesthood because he is the great high priest and is our advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. So we don't need a priest today because Christ brings us to God. He is the great high priest, and he is our intercessor and mediator. And then the false teachings about Mary, Mary is made an intercessor. Mary is now said to be going to be called a uh, co-redemptrix with Christ. And that, I, I think, is another great blasphemy to put someone else up in place of the only mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. While favoring certain elements of Romanism, Hort expressed his opposition to the traditional views of evangelical Christians. In a letter to Dr. Roland Williams in the year 1858, he wrote that, the positive doctrines even of the evangelicals seem to me perverted. There are, I fear, still more serious differences between us on the subject of authority, especially the authority of the Bible. Hort seemed to be expressing views that aligned with those of Newman and the Tractarians. 
both he and Westcott rejected the evangelical belief that the Bible is the infallible Word of God. Hort once wrote, I did recognize providence in Bible writings. Most strongly I recognize it, but I am not prepared to say that it necessarily involves absolute infallibility. Meanwhile, in 1860, Westcott expressed his own doubts. He said, My dear Hort, I too must disclaim setting forth infallibility in the front of my convictions. All I hold is that the more I learn, the more I am convinced that fresh doubts come from my own ignorance, and that at present I find the presumption in favour of the absolute truth, I reject the word infallibility, of Holy Scripture overwhelming. During this period, Charles Darwin published his theory on evolution, which challenged the biblical account of the origins of mankind and indeed called into question the credibility of the Bible as a record of true history. Darwin himself once professed Christianity at an early age, but at some point he turned against it. In his writings, he said, I can indeed hardly see how anyone ought to wish Christianity to be true, for if so, the plain language of the text seems to show that the men who do not believe, and this would include my father, brother, and almost all my best friends, will be everlastingly punished. And this is a damnable doctrine. The Origin of Species, written by Charles Darwin, was released in 1859. And of course, it's evolution uh, theory. It certainly is not proven but when uh, I believe it was Hort obtained the book and read it, he wrote to his friend Westcott that he did not see how uh, Charles Darwin's Origin of Species could be refuted. Hort specifically said he thought Darwin's theory was unanswerable. He also rejected the Genesis account of the Garden of Eden. Meanwhile, in the year 1890, Westcott would write, No one now, I suppose, holds that the first three chapters of Genesis, for example, give a literal history. I could never understand how anyone reading them with open eyes could think they did. Upon reading their correspondence, it becomes clear what Hort meant when he spoke of the dangerous heresies he and Westcott held to since their views were a strong departure from Orthodox Christian teaching. They had problems in every area, whether it was ecclesiology, uh, church doctrine, whether it was Christology, doctrine of Christ, uh, soteriology, doctrine of salvation. They were completely apostate and her heretical in all of those areas. Hort even rejected the doctrine that Christ died on the cross as a substitute for the sins of the world. The popular doctrine of substitution is an immoral and material counterfeit. Nothing can be more unscriptural than the limiting of Christ's bearing our sins and sufferings to his death. But indeed, that is only one aspect of an almost universal heresy. Yet because Hort kept his beliefs hidden from public view, the academic world was able to embrace his imaginary theory about the history of the biblical text. And then after they finished the 1881, that wasn't enough. They had to sell it. So Hort was the mastermind who wrote an introduction to their Greek text. What Hort did was to falsify information give guesswork and hypothesis, very little evidence, very little documentation, selling this polluted text to the scholarly world. And it worked. All the men, except Bergen and a few others in England, were convinced this was the way to go. Germany took it up, France, Italy, United States of America, Canada, uh, our school, Dallas Theological Seminary, Dr. Schaefer, that was convincing there. Uh, it went over to Princeton, 
and went over to Southern Baptist in Louisville and uh, A.T. Robertson. It just took the scholarly world by storm. But it was based not on fact, but on fiction and guesswork, but cleverness. That Greek New Testament unseated the received text as the basic text of the New Testament. It would appear that Dr. Hort was finally able to undermine what he had called 30 years before, that vile Textus Receptus. Yet scholars argue that the ideas Westcott and Hort relied upon did not begin with them. They didn't actually invent the text all by themselves. Sometimes people give the impression that they worked as independents and all of a sudden out of nowhere, they produced this new text. But if Westcott and Hort did not originate the idea for a new Greek text, where did it come from? 19th century minister Robert L. Dabney argued that evangelical critics had adopted their views from the mint of infidel rationalism, which he said is grounded in the assumption that the evangelists and apostles were not guided by inspiration. In his biography of Dean John Bergen, author Edward Goulburn said that Bergen's greatest fight was against the rationalist approach to understanding the Bible. He wrote that rationalism busies itself industriously with the Word of God to see whether it cannot call in question its certainty and throw doubt upon its infallibility. The initial question of rationalism, the question by which the evil one succeeded in supplanting the loyalty of our first mother to her creator was, yea, hath God said. Goldburn clearly believed that the serpent's questioning of God's word in the garden was a picture of the skeptical arguments engineered by the rationalist critics who took hold in the universities of Germany in the 18th century and would dramatically alter the understanding of the Bible, laying the foundation for the revision of Westcott and Hort. The late Dr. Ian Paisley wrote that no Bible believer should be deceived by the parading of great names in the field of biblical scholarship when these very men are but the parrots of the rationalists of another century. The case they present is not their own, but a modern presentation of an ancient heresy. Although the Bible says of itself that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, the rationalist movement was driven by the belief that the Bible is not inspired, but was the mere invention of ordinary men, like any other book of history. They believed miracles and the supernatural should be understood through rational explanation. The attack began at the beginning with a skeptical view of the book of Genesis. In the 17th century, a Jewish Dutch philosopher named Baruch Spinoza is often seen as the first man to question the authorship of Moses. Spinoza had been educated by an ex-Jesuit priest. He once wrote, Belief that Moses was the author of the Pentateuch is ungrounded and irrational. Spinoza was excommunicated from his synagogue, and his work would later be called a book forged in hell. But his influence would be furthered by a French physician named Jean Astruc, who developed a more systematic method of denying the authorship of Moses, and would become known as the man who originated skeptical criticism of the Bible. Ostrock was born from a long line of faithful martyrs who had laid down their lives for Christ, yet he turned away from the faith himself and is said to have become a wicked and immoral man. The Reverend J.M. Coleman wrote that Voltaire describes Ostrock as a miser and debauchee and possessed with a devil. This was the man who laid the foundation for the destructive criticism of the Bible by his theories of Genesis. Ostrock's ideas would be picked up by two later theologians named Karl Heinrich Graf and Julius Wellhausen, who would develop the theory even further that Moses did not truly write the book of Genesis. 
the Graf Wilhausen uh, hypothesis actually came out of Germany. That's the concept that the Pentateuch was composed of the JEDP documents, which stands for Jehovah Elohim, uh, Deuteronomy, and priestly documents that were all brought together to form the Pentateuch that Moses didn't write it. In spite of what our Lord said, quoting uh, Moses many times in the New Testament and never cast any dispersion on the fact that the law, the Pentateuch, was written by Moses. After years of teaching his critical theories, Julius Wellhausen was eventually troubled by the influence of his work upon others. When he resigned his professorship in 1882, he said, I became a theologian because the scientific treatment of the Bible interested me. Only gradually did I come to understand that a professor of theology also has the practical task of preparing the students for service in the Protestant Church. Instead, despite all caution on my part, I make my hearers unfit for the office. Since then, my theological professorship has been weighing heavily on my conscience. It might be argued that Wellhausen could have avoided his troubled conscience if he had believed what the Bible says about God's promise to preserve his holy word. But God has promised to preserve his word and God preserves his word through people and he puts it upon their hearts. Uh, this is the word of God. He put it on their heart with respect to the canon. They knew that second Peter was in but Barnabas, the epistle of Barnabas was out and he put it upon their heart with respect to the text of Scripture. In the Bible, the psalmist writes that the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The Scripture also says, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Jesus declared that the word of God is truth, and the scripture tells us the truth of the Lord endureth forever. For the Lord is good, and his truth endureth to all generations. All his commandments are sure, they stand fast forever and ever. In the book of Isaiah, God says, My words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord from henceforth and forever. And in Isaiah we read that the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. In the New Testament, the apostle Peter wrote to the church saying, the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Meanwhile, Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Since the time of Westcott and Hort, the critical version of the Bible has been presented as a more accurate representation of the original text. But the argument is built upon a series of suppositions that are called into question by those who defend the traditional readings. And, and, and their reasoning usually goes something like this, and you see this all over the critical text debate. Well, if this is true, this must be true. And if this is true, that must be true. And if this is true, that must be true. And as a result, the critical text is superior without ever having proven the first point. It sounds like what you're saying is that a lot of what the critical text is based on is more theory than it is historic fact. It's more theory and suggestion. And today's suggestion becomes tomorrow's established orthodoxy. And your intelligence, it's what I call the tyranny of the expert. You ask a question and they say, everybody, every intelligent person knows this. Well, how do they know it? Well, of course, if you were an intelligent, scholarly person, you would need to ask that. 
And uh, the answer in the defense of things becomes, well, this is what the experts believe. That's true in evolution. That's true in global warming. That's true in a whole lot of things. They say, well, every intelligent person knows this, so we don't have to explain it. We don't have to defend it. And the tyranny of the expert says, I'm an expert. My friends are experts. You're not an expert. So we know. And that's the defense of so many things. And, and I've come to believe the tyranny of the expert most of the time is being offered because folks absolutely know there aren't any facts that support what they're asserting. And they retreat to that not because they, they uh, don't want to take the time to answer a person. They retreat to that because they know there's no answer. And, and you look at the way that many, many Bible teachers teach the Scripture it, is to go through and say, okay, well, this is what it says, but a better translation would be. Our older and better translations say this. Their entire method of Bible teaching has ba been based around asserting critical text readings over majority text. And if you acknowledge that the critical text isn't based on the oldest and best, we figured out a long time ago that Vaticanus and Sinaiticus were not the best. People are starting to figure out they're not the oldest either, or at least particularly with Sinaiticus and maybe even with Vaticanus, there's some real questions about whether they're as old as people want to think they are. Concerning Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, 19th century scholar Robert L. Dabney questioned both their origin and the dates ascribed to them. In fact, he asserted that the analysis of both was based on little more than guesswork and speculation. He said, The grand foundation of the whole is a bundle of conjectures. None of these codices have a continuous, authentic known history. This charge is eminently true concerning the age which they are pleased to assign those Greek manuscripts which they recommend to us as most venerable, the Vatican, the Alexandrian, and now the Sinai. It is expressly admitted that neither of these has an extant history. No documentary external evidence exists as to the names of the copyists who transcribed them the date or the place of their writing. Nobody knows whence the Vatican manuscript came to the Pope's library or how long it's been there. Tischendorf himself was unable to trace the presence of his favorite codex in the monastery of St. Catherine by external witnesses higher than the 12th century. Their early date is confessedly assigned them by conjecture. In the same manner, George Sales Bishop, a 19th century minister and critic of Westcott and Hort, questioned the dating of the chief manuscript, the Codex Vaticanus, which was first discovered in the Vatican Library in the year 1475. How it got there is unknown. In the 16th century, the Codex was recommended to Desiderius Erasmus by the Vatican's librarian at the time who wished to prove that it was closer to the readings of the Latin Vulgate. But Erasmus rejected it because he believed that the Codex Vaticanus had been somehow altered or tampered with after the Council of Florence in 1435. This was apparently suggested to have been a secret agreement of that council. The manuscript was hidden away for centuries until it was taken by Napoleon to Paris in 1809, only to be returned to the Vatican in 1815. But during its time in Paris, a Roman Catholic scholar named Johann Leonard Hug examined it and then published a tract on the antiquity of Codex Vaticanus, in which he dated the manuscript to the fourth century. Of this, George Bishop wrote that, Professor Hug labored to prove that the Vatican was written in the early part of the fourth century, but Bishop Marsh puts it two centuries later. The Vaticanus is also called Codex B. Bishop went on to say, B is said to be older. Well, it may be older because less trustworthy, less used, and so not worn up. Or it may not be older. It is first mentioned anywhere in 1475 not 50 years before the Reformation. That is a pretty young document to claim to be Lord over 1,100 documents, many of which may have been, for all we know, a thousand years old. 
Oh, but it is written in great capitals, and it has divisions into paragraphs, such as documents had in Eusebius's time. Yes, and what is there to prevent men from imitating a manuscript of Eusebius's time, and writing at large and for a purpose? The Codex Vaticanus is important because it forms the very foundation of the critical text. According to Dean Bergen, Westcott and Hort developed their theory in such a way that the Vatican's manuscript would become the chief of all Greek manuscripts in the world. In his explanation of Westcott and Hort's theory, Dean Bergen said the following. Thus then, at last, the end of exactly 150 weary pages, the secret comes out. The one point which the respected editors have found to have been all along driving at. The one aim of those many hazy disquisitions of theirs about intrinsic and transcriptional probability. The one reason of all their vague terminology and of their baseless theory of conflation and of their disparagement of the fathers the secret of it all comes out at last. All is summed up in the curt formula, Codex B. Bergen went on to say that Westcott and Hort's theory required that all other materials on the Bible, copies, fathers, and versions, were to be ruthlessly sacrificed, he said, on the altar of Codex B. In other words, all other materials must be made to conform to the Vatican's Greek Bible, Codex B, or the Codex Vaticanus. According to Bergen, that was the theory of Westcott and Hort in a nutshell. Yet the prominence of Vaticanus is largely based on paleographical analysis. Paleography is the study of ancient writings, used to authenticate and to assign dates to ancient manuscripts that come from unknown origins. Incredibly, the practice itself was developed by the Roman Catholic Church as part of the Counter-Reformation. Writing on the history of paleography, James W. Thompson, former president of the American Historical Association, wrote that, the impetus for articulation of a method of proving the authenticity of documents came from doctrinal conflicts of the Reformation and Counter-Reformation. He said, Rome was compelled to fight history with history. Since the Reformation was an appeal to history, the Counter-Reformation was forced to use the same instrument. Thompson explained, that the key founders of paleographical analysis were two Benedictine monks. The first was Jean Mabillon, who developed Latin paleography in the 17th century. His successor, Bernard de Montfalcon, would then develop Greek paleography in the early part of the 18th century. In fact, it was Montfalcon's work that was embraced by Constantine von Tischendorf in his quest for ancient manuscripts. Author James Bentley tells us that, in the field of Greek manuscripts, Tischendorf obtained a work by another famous Benedictine monk, Bernard de Montfalcon, which in 1708 virtually created the study of Greek and Byzantine paleography. Was it merely coincidence that the Roman Church developed a system of evaluating Greek manuscripts so that eventually the Pope's Bible once rejected by Erasmus, would be declared the number one Greek Bible in the world, and in the process would also overthrow the traditional Greek text of the Protestant Reformation. It is worthy to note that after reviewing the work of Westcott and Hort, Dean John Bergen was suspicious of what was really behind their theory. He said, I frankly confess that to me, the wholesale adoption of the theory of the two revisers looks very much indeed like what, in the language of lawyers, is called 
conspiracy. Meanwhile, the speculations concerning the Codex Vaticanus have continued into modern times. Yet most scholars seem oblivious to the fact that its true origins still remain virtually unknown. The late Professor Neville Birdsall is pictured here next to Dr. Bruce Metzger, one of the leading textual critics of the 20th century. Birdsall was considered an expert in paleography and biblical manuscripts. Concerning the Codex Vaticanus, he said that, in short, we cannot be certain of the exact date nor the place of origin of Codex Vaticanus, nor in spite of scholarly efforts can its history before the 15th century be traced. <laughs> Professor Birdsall's analysis of Vaticanus in 1998 seems to confirm the assertions of men like R. L. Dabney and George Sales Bishop. The dating of the Codex is based on conjecture rather than irrefutable science. But what about Codex Sinaiticus? Having been discovered by Constantine von Tischendorf in St. Catherine's Monastery, the manuscript was called the world's oldest Bible. But Greek paleographer Constantine Simonides argued that he was the true author of the Codex and that it had been created by him in the year 1840. While the leading scholars of the day dismissed Simonides' claims, there were those who continued to be suspicious. This is partly because Simonides presented two unique books that were found as part of the Codex. The Epistle of Barnabas, published in 1843, and the Shepherd of Hermas presented in the year 1856. Nearly identical copies of both books were found as part of the Codex Sinaiticus in 1859. How could these rare books, unknown to the rest of the world, have been in Simonides' possession? And how could matching copies appear in Tischendorf's Codex years later, if Simonides had nothing to do with it? In 1874, renowned Bible scholar James Donaldson analyzed the comparison between the works of Simonides and those found in the Sinai manuscript. He began by expressing his doubts about the story told by Tischendorf, who claimed to have found the first parts of the Codex in St. Catherine's Monastery in 1844, where pages of the manuscript had supposedly been discarded in a rubbish basket and were being used by the monks to feed the fires. Tischendorf claimed he had rescued the pages from almost certain destruction. Years later, he would return to St. Catherine's to discover the rest of the Codex in 1859. In reviewing these events, James Donaldson wrote the following. He said, the torn and scattered fragments which had been cast into the large basket to feed the fire had come forth. They had all united and now constituted a complete whole, a whole so complete that the like of it does not exist. Not only were the other parts of the Old Testament found, but the only complete unsealed manuscript of the New Testament was contained in it. And added to this was the complete Greek of the Epistle of Barnabas and nearly as much of the Greek of the pastor of Hermas as had been given in the Simonides manuscripts. Donaldson went on to say, There are many circumstances in this narrative calculated to awaken suspicion and there are other circumstances of an equally suspicious nature which I have not mentioned. But those who are most competent to judge have allowed that it seems a genuine ancient manuscript. 
Donaldson seemed almost reluctant to call it genuine, but chose to defer to the consensus of others. It is also noteworthy to consider that the Simonides affair ended in 1864, and yet Donaldson published his suspicion a decade later. Yet one aspect of Donaldson's work was challenged by a newspaper called the Athenaeum. They claimed that the Epistle of Barnabas, published by Simonides, must have been a forgery. They wrote that, Simonides produced in attestation of the genuineness and date of his edition of Barnabas, a newspaper of Smyrna, published in 1843, containing a long review of the work. The paper and the print of the newspaper looked uncommonly fresh, and on subsequent inquiries at Smyrna, it was found that no such newspaper had ever existed. Simonides had taken the trouble to fabricate his newspaper as well as the date of his edition. Yet the newspaper in question was called the Star of the East. A later investigation proved that the Athenaeum was apparently mistaken and that a newspaper by that name did in fact exist in Smyrna during the 1840s. Pictured here is a copy of the article with a review of Simonides' Epistle of Barnabas dated 1843. Though Donaldson was willing to accept the official story, he still questioned the dating of Codex Sinaiticus. In particular, the type of Greek used in the Shepherd of Hermas. He said, The Greek is not the Greek of the at least first five centuries of the Christian era. If Donaldson was correct, that might push the dating of the Codex Sinaiticus out of the fourth century entirely. While Westcott and Hort embraced Sinaiticus without question, there were those who continued to investigate the story of Simonides into the 20th century. In 1907, James A. Farrar published his book on literary forgeries, where he examined the controversy in detail. While he recognized that the circumstantial evidence in favor of Simonides was significant, he ultimately believed that the case had never been fully resolved. He said, It is to be regretted that this matter was never cleared up at the time the claim was made. On the side of Simonides is his unlimited skill in calligraphy, the very audacity of such a claim if entirely baseless, the remarkable presence in the Codex of a portion of the Shepherd of Hermas, which Simonides was the first scholar ever to have seen in Greek, the fact that no visitor to the monastery at Mount Sinai before 1844 had ever seen or heard of such a work as belonging to the monks, and the very extraordinary story told by Tischendorf of his discovery and acquisition of the Codex. The question, therefore, pending the acquisition of further evidence, must remain among the interesting but unsolved mysteries of literature. I can easily believe that Tischendorf and others did not do a thorough study to figure out where this came from because they were looking for something they thought was ancient, something that fit their beliefs. And in Sinaiticus, they found something that to them was the greatest Bible discovery ever made. And, you know, they, they found something, they wanted it to be that. And it becomes very easy to believe something is this when you want it so badly to be this. Yet it is undeniable that most scholars today believe Vaticanus and Sinaiticus are both genuine ancient manuscripts. But if they are the most ancient, does this mean they are the most reliable, as argued by Westcott and Hort? The issue becomes important when one considers that the Westcott and Hort theory would be used to produce the underlying Greek text for a vast majority of all the new Bibles in the 20th century. The Westcott and Hort theory is based on the preconceived conviction that our New Testament texts should be based upon Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. It clearly is different from the received text. And so now we must develop a theory 
that will be tailor-made for this new text that we've adopted. If this text is shorter, then, and it is shorter, uh, it's shorter in nearly 2,900, it has about 2,900 fewer words. The reason for the fewer words is because there are shorter readings in both Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Westcott and Hort's theory was that the shorter readings more accurately represented the original scripture and that the longer readings were created deliberately by editors who added many words and passages to the Bible. This was done during the alleged revision that happened between 250 and 350 AD. Once these editors created the longer version of the text, it was then duplicated thousands of times over, which is the reason why the majority of Greek manuscripts contain the fuller readings. It was this startling aspect of the Westcott and Hort theory that was refuted by Dr. Scrivener as having no historic foundation whatsoever. There's not any trace of this anywhere in history. This is simply something that Westcott and Hort uh, dreamed up. Despite their lack of evidence, Westcott and Hort asserted that portions of the New Testament, such as the last 12 verses of Mark, the story of the woman taken in adultery, the story of the angel troubling the waters at the pool of Bethesda, and the account of Christ praying for those who crucified him, these and many other readings were supposedly not part of the original text. Dean John Bergen argued against these assertions and demonstrated how Westcott and Hort rejected a majority of the biblical evidence in favor of their own unprovable theory. He gave as an example the testimony of Christ on the cross from Luke 23, 34. He said, these 12 precious words, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Doctors Westcott and Hort entertain that the words are spurious, and yet those words are found in every known uncle and in every known cursive copy, except four, besides being found in every ancient version. It happens that our Lord's intercession on behalf of his murderers is attested by upwards of 40 patristic witnesses from every part of ancient Christendom. How could our revisionists dare to insinuate doubts into wavering hearts and unlearned heads? Where, as here, they were bound to know there exists no manner of doubt at all. While Westcott and Hort theorized that such differences in the text were the result of deliberate changes made by the early church, their opponents argued that there was a much more historic explanation, one that dates back to the apostles in the first century. And corruption seems to go back to the very beginning. Paul is warning about corruption before the canon of the New Testament is complete. In his letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul wrote, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Because of this, defenders of the traditional Greek text argue that the earliest manuscripts are not necessarily the most accurate. I've been in ministry for 40 years. I spent the first 10 years of my life as an advocate of the critical text. I was not an advocate of it because I'd studied the matter closely, but virtually every book I read advocated the critical text. In Bible college, I never heard the issue discussed one way or another. But after about 10 years of ministry and occasionally making statements that would be pro-critical text, one particular individual challenged me kindly and privately. I would not have listened if he'd been rough with me, but he challenged me kindly and privately to study the situation, asked me questions like, how do you know the oldest text is best? And uh, that drove me to allocate a year of my life just to study this, to try and get a handle on it. I was especially helped along the way by Wilbur Pickering's book, The Identity of the New Testament Text. 
in understanding the issue. And if you found a corrupt text that was produced to the Book of Romans the day after God inspired the Book of Romans, and we know that there were corrupt texts being produced immediately from statements by the early church leaders, if you found one of those texts today, it would be the oldest text anybody had, and it would be corrupt. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul gave another warning, saying, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us. The pulpit commentary describes the mention of a letter in Paul's warning as some letter either forged in the apostle's name or pretending to inculcate his views. Meanwhile, 18th century scholar John Gill said Paul was warning of those who might be forging a letter and counterfeiting their hands, for such practices began to be used very early. Spurious epistles of the apostle Paul were carried about. F.H.A. Scrivener also refuted the idea that earlier manuscripts would necessarily be more reliable. He said, the worst corruptions to which the New Testament has ever been subjected originated within a hundred years after it was composed. In his book on the identity of the New Testament text, Dr. Wilbur Pickering wrote that, Gaius, an Orthodox father, who wrote between A.D. 175 and 200, names Aesculapiades, Theodotus, Hermophilus, and Apollonides as heretics who prepared corrupted copies of the scripture and who had disciples who multiplied copies of their fabrications. Also in the second century was an early church father, Irenaeus of Lyon, who warned about the corruptions of the Gnostics who were considered heretics. In his book, Against Heresies, he wrote that, Marcion and his followers have betaken themselves to mutilating the scripture, not acknowledging some books at all, and curtailing the gospel according to Luke and the epistles of Paul, which they have themselves thus shortened. Defenders of the traditional text believe that this Gnostic influence is most likely behind the shorter readings found in Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. They've dropped out a total of 2,886 Greek words. Just dropped them right out. Just eliminated them because of the influence of the Alexandria, Egypt Gnostics who wanted to change the text for doctrinal purposes. That's a lot of verses, a lot of words to drop out of the New Testament. Well, that's a, as much as we've got in First and Second Peter. So we've got First and Second Peter taken out of the modern text. But if a volume of text equal to First and Second Peter was removed from the revision of Westcott and Hort, what are some of the omissions, and why are they significant? When you drop out words, if they're key words, doctrines are dropped as well and changed. And that's exactly what's happened. Dean John Bergen wrote that the principal aim of heretical corruptors is to deny that Jesus Christ is co-equal God in the Trinity. Meanwhile, George Sales Bishop argued that the revision of Westcott and Hort weakens and removes the divinity of Christ in many places. One of the most obvious omissions of their text is seen in Ephesians chapter 3. In the King James, we read, The mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Yet in the Westcott and Hort text, the words by Jesus Christ are removed. It is an omission also found in most modern Bibles today. Another controversial reading is found in 1 Timothy 3.16. In the King James we read, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Yet the revision of Westcott and Hort changes the word God and reads, He 
who was manifested in the flesh. As a result, most modern Bibles substitute the word He in place of God. And great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Gnostics didn't believe He was God. How could He be manifest in the flesh? So they take out Thaos, put in Hoss or Ha, either who or which. And over 300 times in the manuscript evidence, Thaos, God, is there. And less than seven and one and six and the other, 13 times, it's either Hoss or Ha. What is 300 versus 13? But because of their twisted and warped uh, manuscript evidence, they throw out the documentation that's there. Perhaps the most deceptive aspect of Gnostic teaching is that it is based in the text of the Bible, yet it dramatically changes the meanings of words, adapting the scripture into its own mystical system. The word Gnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. When the Apostle Paul warned Timothy to avoid oppositions of science, falsely so-called, the Greek word he used for science was gnosis. As a result, some believe Paul was warning of the early Gnostic deceptions. Paul also warned the church in Corinth, saying, but I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, ye might well bear with him. Early church fathers like Irenaeus believed that the Gnostics preached a completely different version of who Jesus was. Many Gnostics held to a peculiar doctrine known as adoptionism. The term adoptionism is basically the idea that God adopted Jesus he took into union for a few years the Christ spirit, but it's a heresy. We know things that the apostles did not know, it was not imparted to them. We have the secret knowledge. We can impart this knowledge to you. The Gnostics generally believed that Jesus was just an ordinary man, but that he himself was not the Christ. The Christ spirit, sometimes called the Christ principle, was something he only received once he was baptized by John the Baptist. The apostles told you that Jesus is the Christ, but they only had part of the story. To the Gnostics, the Christ spirit was separate from Jesus himself. See, the Gnostic heretics believed in a spirit Christology. The Gnostics did not believe that Jesus Christ was one person. And when the new versions used this Gnostic manuscripts to divide Jesus and Christ, like one of the verses you're going to refer to in 1 John, that splits up the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what they believe, what the Gnostics believe, that's why they changed these texts. That's why they split Christ and Jesus. Uh, the Gnostics believed that Jesus was an ordinary human being like you and I are, and he had sin, he needed to be saved, he's lost. Joseph was his father, God was not his father, no miracle of virgin birth, and he's just one person. The Christ principle came upon Jesus, according to the Gnostic theories, at his baptism, and left him at Calvary. So Jesus Christ is not one person of the Gnostics. And this is the heresy that is uh, given uh, and warned about at the end of our Bible. And yet there's about 80 places where Jesus is either omitted or in some way separated from Christ or from a statement of deity in the modern critical text. And it goes back to these two old manuscripts which reflect this heresy. One example of what Dr. Mormon refers to is said to be found in 1 John chapter 4. From the King James we read, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of Antichrist. Yet in the Westcott and Hort text, the verse reads, And every spirit 
which confesseth not Jesus is not of God. The word Christ is omitted. The same is true in most every modern Bible. Yeah, they're, they're splitting up the, the unity of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, come in the flesh, His incarnation. The Gnostics didn't believe Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. At the end of your Bible, beginning in, in, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, it says, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is a Christ? And there are five warnings like that at the end of your Bible. And I had read these for many years, but couldn't understand why the emphasis upon this. And so there seems to be this dichotomy between Jesus and Christ. And then we began to realize that many times in the modern Bibles, Jesus and Christ are separated. Of the many examples, another is found in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 20, which in the King James reads, Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. But in the Westcott and Hort text it reads, They should tell no man that he was the Christ. The name of Jesus is omitted. Then in Acts chapter 16 verse 31, when Paul and Silas testify to the Philippian jailer, in the King James they say, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. But in the Westcott and Hort text, it reads, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved. The word Christ is removed. Meanwhile, in Matthew chapter 8, when Jesus confronts a demoniac, the demons cry out, in the King James we read, And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? But in the Westcott and Hort text, it reads, What have we to do with thee, thou Son of God? The name Jesus is removed. These are just a few examples of changes made by Westcott and Hort. In his book on early manuscripts, Dr. Jack Mormon documented 86 examples where modern versions of the Bible disassociate the name Jesus from other titles and acts of deity. Where the authorized version would have the full title, Jesus Christ, maybe it's only Jesus by himself or Christ by himself. Dr. Mormon believes that the character of these changes point toward the warnings given by early church fathers about the corruptions of the Gnostics and their doctrinal reasons for altering the biblical text. The passage in, in John chapter 1 and verse 18 where it says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. It's remarkable that these two manuscripts that show the heresy of adoptionism in some 80 places with this separation between Jesus and a statement of, of deity also say in that portion uh, rather than the only begotten Son uh, refer to Christ as the only begotten God and that is Gnosticism. Dr. Thomas Holland wrote that the Gnostics taught that Christ was a begotten God created by God the Father, whom they called the unbegotten God. Dean John Bergen believed that the text of John 1.18 had been depraved by an early Gnostic group known as the Valentinians. F.H.A. Scrivener also questioned the reading, saying, the heretic Arius also upholds God only begotten, which circumstance does not help to reconcile us to a term that reverential minds instinctively shrink from. Arius was a renowned heretic from the fourth century 
who believed that Jesus, as the Son of God, did not share an equal divinity with God, but was a creature created by God the Father. Yet Arius believed that it was right to worship Jesus. As such, believers would be worshiping a creature rather than the Creator Himself, something clearly forbidden in Romans chapter 1 and verse 25. Hence, Arianism was condemned as a heresy and seen as a form of idolatry. The phrase, only begotten God, is unknown anywhere else in the Bible. In contrast, the Apostle John used the term, only begotten Son, four times in his writings. It would appear he was referencing Psalm chapter 2 and verse 7, which reads, The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. Dr. Thomas Holland argued that Arius, along with other well-known heretics, had been tainted with Gnosticism, and hence cited John 1.18 as only begotten God. He said, on the other hand, we find many of the Orthodox Fathers who opposed Gnosticism, quoting John 1.18 as only begotten Son. It is also worth noting that the New World Translation, used by Jehovah Witnesses, employs the phrase only begotten God with a little g, which, as Dr. Holland points out, is in line with their teaching that Christ is a created God. Their version of John chapter 1 reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was a God. Hippolytus, an early church father, described certain Gnostics called the Nascenes. They claimed to receive secret wisdom from the serpent, who offered to them what he offered Eve in Genesis, the opportunity to be a God. Gnosticism is said to be the blending of pagan philosophies with various Christian teachings. Many believe its influence continues in the world today and can be found in a variety of groups, including the Freemasons, the Rosicrucians, and the entire New Age movement that teaches the same doctrine of the ancient heretics, that man does not need to be saved by God, but rather needs only to become his own God. For you to know what the truth is, you must look within yourself. As shown earlier, Irenaeus warned about the Gnostic corruptions of the biblical text. He said, they do violence to the good words of scripture in adapting them to their wicked fabrications. Certainly Gnosticism tears down every foundational doctrine of the Christian faith deity of Christ is gone. You don't need Christ. Christ is not the Savior. Didn't come to seek you to save that which was lost. That's why Matthew 18 11 is completely eliminated in the Bibles, the new Bibles. Uh, it says the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. The Gnostics didn't believe the Son of Man came to save anybody. He didn't come from anybody. He was just a man. So they eliminate. Gnosticism takes away the person of Christ and it is Antichrist. There's no question about it. Antichrist, anybody that says everybody is saved, Anybody that says the devil himself is saved, that's Gnostic doctrine. That's Antichrist. It's, it's, a, it's a gospel that's going to be proclaimed. It's a gospel that's proclaimed by the modernist liberals today. All men are saved. Universal salvation. Universal fatherhood of God, brotherhood of men. This is Gnosticism. And it's Antichrist. It's in the versions because they don't have the proper Greek base in the New Testament. This is an authentic copy of the English Revised Version, which was transmitted through our family. It is a translation of the Westcott Hort Greek text. It was a new Greek text that they then translated into this version called the English Revised Version. The New Testament was translated first as a gradually brought out the New Greek text to the committee of the southern province of the Anglican Church. Then 
they translated the Old Testament. The Old Testament was completed in 1885, and therefore then this uh, version was printed. It's fascinating because this is not what they claim it to be. They claim it to be being the version set forth in A.D. 1611. It is not. It is an entirely new translation based on the new Greek text created by Westcott and Hort. Dean John Bergen seems to have been the first to note that the revisers of 1881 created a new Greek text. But the process of revising that text was just the beginning. In 1898, a German textual critic named Eberhard Nessel published the first edition of a Greek New Testament called Novum Testamentum Greece. Nessel combined the work of Westcott and Hort with that of Constantine von Tischendorf and added to it the work of renowned scholar Richard Weymouth, who authored the Weymouth New Testament. After 1901, he replaced the work of Weymouth with that of Bernhard Weiss. The Nessel text was later published by the British and Foreign Bible Society in 1904. They adopted the newly developed Greek to replace the Textus Receptus. The Nessel text would undergo 13 editions between 1904 and 1927. Then in the 1950s, another scholar named Kurt Alland began to revise the text. By 1963, the 25th edition was published with the name Nessel Alland on the cover. But like Westcott and Hort before him, Kurt Alland held to controversial ideas about the New Testament. Kurt Alland, in two books that he's written, suggested that there would be a, a, a better chance of church unity if we perhaps would drop Second Peter, Hebrews, and Revelation from the canon. He's got two books that indicate this. Alland's views of the New Testament were based, in part, on his belief that the apostles did not actually write the Gospels and epistles that bear their names. He said that, the authority of the New Testament had as its presupposition the fact that her apostles and eyewitnesses were speaking. As soon as critical scholarship proved that this or that New Testament writing could not have been written by an apostle, the authority of its author collapsed along with it. And with the authority of the author, the authority of the New Testament writing collapsed. And with the authority of the New Testament writing, collapse the authority of the church. Kurt Alan seemed to be describing the effect of modern textual criticism on the entire Western world that systematically turned away from Christianity in the wake of so many doubts created about the Bible. As for Alan himself, he even went so far as to question whether or not Jesus was a real person. If the epistles were really written by the apostles whose names they bear and by people who were closest to Jesus, then the real question arises. Was there really a Jesus? Can Jesus really have lived if the writings of his closest companions are filled with so little of his reality, so little in them of the reality of the historical Jesus? When we observe this, Assuming that the writings about which we are speaking really come from their alleged authors, it almost then appears as if Jesus were a mere phantom and that the real theological power lay not with him, but with the apostles and with the earthly church. The late Dr. Henry Morris, the man known as the founder of the modern creation science movement, once wrote, that both Nessel and Alland were German theological skeptics. Yet these men were two of the most important caretakers of the Greek New Testament in the 20th century. And that's one of the facts of textual criticism. The great movers and shapers of the critical text from the very beginning 
were theological liberals. Ecumenical dialogue was an important goal for Kurt Aland and his approach to the Bible, an ideology that would ultimately lead him to Rome. Following in the footsteps of men like Philip Schaff and Constantine von Tischendorf, Kurt Aland took multiple visits to the Vatican, meeting with Pope Paul VI and then later with Pope John Paul II. The connections with Rome and the critical text have existed from the beginning. Both Westcott and Hort defended Romanist ideas. And even Samuel P. Tregellis, a prominent scholar who played a key role in defending the manuscripts used by the revision committee, had been sent beforehand to the Vatican with letters of recommendation from Cardinal Wiseman in order to study the Codex Vaticanus. It was Cardinal Wiseman who had launched the Oxford movement years earlier in order to bring England back to Rome. Kurt Aland also worked with another ecumenical scholar who was one of the leading textual critics of the 20th century, Dr. Bruce Manning Metzger. Bruce Metzger, some people think he was a conservative. In fact, he was the one that gave uh, Griffith Thomas lectures at my seminary, Dallas Theological Seminary, several years back. I wrote to the then president, Dr. Don Campbell, that I went to school with. He was one year ahead of me at Dallas. I said, Don, I said, this man, why'd you have that guy up there speaking to your seminary who's a liberal modernist? Oh, he's all right, he's this and he's that. Well, Bruce Metzger also, as you know, may have know, is the editor of the Reader's Digest Bible that criticized and cracked down and, and shortened up and abbreviated the scriptures. He said, Peter didn't write Peter and John didn't write Revelation and John didn't write, and all these books, completely higher critical. Uh, Bruce Metzger is editor of a number of uh, prestigious books that are just, uh, just, again, full of liberalism, bring the Bible down to nothing but mythology. Metzger's most famous disciple is Bart Ehrman the best-selling author whose books are dedicated to teaching others that the Bible is not really the Word of God. It is interesting to note that Ehrman claims he began as an evangelical Christian, but some believe that once he was exposed to the textual theories of Dr. Metzger, his faith was eventually destroyed. Dr. Jeffrey Koo wrote that Metzger's philosophy and methodology only lead to chronic uncertainty and perpetual unbelief. Metzger's uncertainty began with Genesis, which he believed contained myths rather than a literal account of the creation. In the introduction of his Reader's Digest Bible, we are told that the biblical authors were great creative artists instead of prophets of old who were inspired by God. Metzger was also the co-editor of the New Oxford Annotated Bible, which tells the reader that the books of Moses were derived out of a matrix of myth, legend, and history, which appeared as early as the time of David and Solomon, but that only later in modified form became a part of scripture. If this were true, it would mean that Moses could not have written the books that bear his name. Yet Metzger and the editors he worked with provide no proof of their assertions, but merely speculate after the same manner as Baruch Spinoza and Jean Ostruck. Nevertheless, Metzger's influence is significant because he was one of the leading Bible critics of the 20th century. Uh, Metzger was a, a real a strange character. He wasn't a Bible believer, but he has his... Uh, prints all over uh, the modern translations of the scripture because he worked on so many of them. Bruce Metzger, while he was alive, was, was the leading American textual critic. Uh, he was the man that people went to to determine which reading, when there were several readings available, which reading of, the, of a particular verse in the Bible should be included in the United Bible Society or Nestle Elan text. Uh, he was on both committees. Metzger was also a contributor to the Revised Standard Version, 
He also led the committee for the new Revised Standard Version, which received the official approval of the Roman Catholic Church. This edition tells us it is an ecumenical study Bible. Bruce Metzger presented a copy to Pope John Paul II in a private audience in 1993. But working with Catholics was not unfamiliar for him. Metzger worked with a Jesuit priest named Carlo Maria Martini on the Greek New Testament Committee, and then again with another Jesuit named George McRae on the New Revised Standard Version Committee. Metzger had also taken an earlier trip to the Vatican to meet with Pope Paul VI in 1973. On that occasion, he and others presented a copy of the RSV Common Bible to the Pope. Metzger wrote that the Pope accepted the copy as a significant step in furthering ecumenical relations among the churches. It was this Common Bible that Dr. Ian Paisley once referred to as the Bible of the Antichrist, the title of a pamphlet he published in 1973. And Metzger, his interest was promoting ecumenism, at least between Catholics, Protestants, and Greek Orthodox. Oh, that, that was his total purpose. This is his stated purpose. He didn't, he didn't make any bones about that. Uh, he wanted a, 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 a unified, uh, if you would, uh, interdenominational Bible that everybody could use. That was his goal. Uh, even though he believed that Jonah was a folk tale, uh, and uh, he says that Isaiah was written by two or three different, different people, uh, Mesker didn't even believe that Paul wrote 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus. So uh, you have this guy translating the Bible, not really believing in the Bible, not believing in the inspiration of the scriptures, and his purpose is to get something acceptable to all the key denominations, Protestants, Baptists, Catholics, and Orthodox. Though Metzger was clearly given over to a skeptical view of the Bible, he was highly regarded by otherwise conservative teachers of the gospel. After his death in 2007, one of his former students, John Piper, in a personal tribute to Dr. Metzger said that, in his prime, there was no greater authority on New Testament textual criticism than Dr. Metzger in the English-speaking world. We spoke with Dr. James White, one of the leading defenders of the critical text and author of the book, The King James Only Controversy, a work that was highly praised by Bruce Metzger in his lifetime. We asked about Metzger's view of the writings of Moses, wondering how he could be accepted by conservatives when he seemed to deny the foundation of the Bible itself. What are your thoughts? Because Metzger is often criticized about his view of the Old Testament that he apparently didn't think Moses could have written Genesis and Exodus wow. and so on. That's like a view of 80% of all Old Testament scholars today. It is. It's amazing. So, so many of my, uh, this, is, this is why we don't necessarily engage these folks all that well. And that's why I'm glad I ended up going to Fuller Seminary. Uh, so that I can point these things out. We are in the minority in biblical scholarship if we believe in mosaic authorship. I'll defend it. We need to keep defending it. But there was nothing unusual about that. In fact, it would have been absolutely shocking had he had another view when he was at Princeton at that point in time. Um, we, unfortunately, as conservatives, gave the Old Testament field over to the liberals for quite some time, and we're only just now starting to make some inroads and in getting some of it back. And almost any commentary published within the past 50 years that is, and has any scholarly, quote-unquote, uh, credentials to it at all is going to minimally discuss uh, alt alternative theories of authorship. And the vast majority are just going to begin with the assumption that if there was somebody named Moses, he may have had something to do with some of the core teachings of this document but that the vast majority was written long, long, long afterwards by all sorts of other people. So he was, he was completely in line with the schools that he was at to hold those, those positions. Dr. White makes it clear that he himself does not agree with Metzger's view, but he is not necessarily compelled to reject the rest of his scholarship because of it. 
I fully disagree with it. I fully disagree with it. Um, but am I ready to um, say that, therefore, uh, if someone is wrong in this area, that they're wrong in every other area? I can't do that. Not consistently. Not logically. Yet the denial of Moses as the author of Genesis and the other four books that bear his name calls into question the entire foundation of the Bible and even the gospel itself. Throughout the scripture, Moses is repeatedly referred to as the true author. In the Old Testament, we read of the book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. The Lord had said to Joshua before he went into battle, only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. The Lord said, Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Meanwhile, in the New Testament, Jesus himself said, Did not Moses give you the law? And again he said, have ye not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him? Jesus also said, For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Jesus clearly confirmed that it was Moses who wrote the books that bear his name. Therefore, if Moses were not the true author, then Jesus could not be the infallible Savior. Rather, he becomes a misinformed storyteller, repeating mere myths and legends. If what Jesus taught about Moses was untrue, how could anyone trust what he said about the kingdom of heaven, or the warnings of hell, or the promises of salvation and life eternal for those who put faith in him? Charles Spurgeon once said, We will not have it that God, in his holy book, makes mistakes about matters of history or of science any more than he does upon the great truths of salvation. If the Lord be God, he must be infallible. And if he can be described as in error in the little respects of human history and science, he cannot be trusted in the greater matters. As shown earlier, the doubts about the authorship of Moses came not from Christian scholars, but from unbelievers. Yet does it matter to the church today whether or not a person actually believes the Bible in order to be accepted as a textual critic? If you're saying, well, you need to have a Christian worldview uh, to accurately handle uh, the, the textual criticism of the Bible, that would be like saying that you need to have a Christian worldview to be a heart surgeon. Do you believe that? Um, I've, I've actually had cardiac ablation. I had a, I had a, a, a heart procedure uh, for a, a super rapid heart rate uh, because I'm, I'm an athlete and so uh, sometimes at our age we develop this thing and and uh, I had what's called cardiac ablation to try to, to control this super rapid heart rate above 255 beats per minute at times. Um, now, I did not ask uh, whether my surgeon uh, had a Christian worldview, uh, but he was a extremely skilled cardiologist and surgeon. Dr. White's argument is based on the idea that textual criticism is merely a science, like mathematics or medicine. Therefore, it does not matter if the information is handled by unbelievers. But as we have seen, there is very little in the way of provable historic fact in the critical text theory, which, as R. L. Dabney noted, is based primarily on conjecture and speculation. 19th century scholar A. E. Hausman whose works are often quoted by modern critics, admitted to the limitations of textual criticism and warned against those who give it too much credibility. He said, 
Textual criticism is not a branch of mathematics, nor indeed an exact science at all. It deals with a matter not rigid and constant, like lines and numbers, but fluid and variable. It therefore is not susceptible of hard and fast rules. It would be much easier if it were. That is why people try to pretend that it is, or at least behave as if they thought so. Because textual criticism is not an exact science, its opponents argue that it is unavoidably influenced by the personal beliefs of the critical scholar. Dr. Wilbur Pickering, in his book on the identity of the New Testament text, commented on some of the speculative methods used in modern times. Citing Dr. Bruce Metzger, he wrote, Metzger said, it is understandable that in some cases, different scholars will come to different evaluations. Metzger's in some cases is decidedly an understatement. In fact, even the same scholars will vacillate as demonstrated by the more than 500 changes introduced into the third edition of the Greek text produced by the United Bible Societies as compared with the second edition. The same committee of five editors prepared both. It thus appears that in the space of three years, with no significant accretion of new evidence, the same group of five scholars change their mind in over 500 places. It is hard to resist the suspicion that they were guessing. In light of Dr. Pickering's analysis, what sort of guessing or choices concerning the text of the Bible would be engineered by men who have an apostate view of the Christian faith. It is a strange thing about error. Error has a, has a hypnotic effect. It goes against reason. And the way that, it's, it's much like a theory of evolution, how that, or Marxism, how from a small beginning it spread everywhere. And so this spread. And all of the blessing that had come from the printing of the received text and the great Reformation Bibles of, of Europe, that must now be overturned. And now we've got this new Bible. Prior to the revision of 1881, there were warnings about the spiritual condition of textual critics in Europe at the time. Years before the revision took place, a renowned Baptist minister named J.C. Philpot was asked about whether or not a revision of the Bible was a good idea. In response, he wrote the following. Would it be desirable to have a new translation of the scriptures? We fully admit that there are here and there passages of which the translation might be improved, but who are to undertake it? Into whose hands would the translation fall? What an opportunity for the enemies of truth to give us a mutilated, false Bible. Philpot clearly recognized that the enemies of the scripture were at work in the academic world and that they had flooded the field of textual criticism. He went on to say, Of course, they must be learned men, great critics, scholars and divines. But these are notoriously either tainted with popery or infidelity. Where are the men, learned yet sound in truth, not to say alive unto God, who possess the necessary qualifications for so important a work? And can erroneous men, dead in trespasses and sins, carnal, worldly, ungodly persons, spiritually translate a book written by the Blessed Spirit? We have not the slightest ground for hope that they would be godly men such as we have reason to believe translated the scriptures into our present version. Inspiration refers to the author, holy men God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's the original. And yet God has promised to keep that intact. And he has. And we would look to translators who, like uh, the preface to the readers, the A.V. translators sought him 
that hath the key of David. And they were humble men, and they were scholars, but they were spiritual men. We have to look at the hand of God, but of course we know that, yes, inspiration refers only to the originals, and yet God's promised to preserve it. And uh, He did indeed. He did indeed. And yet he, he preserves it through spiritual men. We raise the issue with Dr. James White, since the argument of those who defend the critical text is that the spiritual condition of a scholar or critic is somehow unimportant. Dr. White refused to acknowledge that skeptical footnotes offered by unbelievers are simply not the same as insightful footnotes given by men of faith. Why didn't the people who read the 1611 and read the hundreds of marginal notes that said some manuscripts don't contain this verse at Luke chapter 17, why did that not cause the same explosion? That's my point. My point is they were that the, the scriptures were being handled by God-fearing men of faith, men who were... The worldview is different. Lives. The worldview is different. But I don't think Westcott, Hort, Bruce Metzger, Kurt Alon, I don't think they fit into that category. You can't, even trying to put, even trying to put them in the same, in the same area like that is an invalid, uh, invalid comparison. And there is almost, I don't, I don't know almost anybody who has a clue what Kurt Allen's views on theology were. As we have seen, the views of Kurt Alland, where the text of the Bible are concerned, were declared in his own writings. But is it a defensible argument to suggest that those who hold to a skeptical view of the Bible should be trusted to handle the Word of God at any level? One of the questions I ask when I'm talking about to people, I ask, number one, would you uh, put a thief in charge of a bank? Of course, they say, of course not. Would you put a fox in charge of the chickens? No. Would you put an unbeliever in charge of your Bible? The scripture says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But if men do not believe that the words of scripture actually come from God, then what could their faith be based on? The Bible warns of those in the last days who would be heady, high-minded, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, and says, from such, turn away. In the book of Ezekiel, God reproved the children of Israel for allowing unbelievers into the temple of God. He said to them, in that ye have brought into my sanctuary strangers, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary to pollute it, and they have broken my covenant, and ye have not kept the charge of my holy things. But the practice of working with unbelievers can be traced back to Westcott and Hort. They included on their committee a Unitarian minister named Dr. Vance Smith, one who openly rejected the divinity of Christ. Dean Bergen wrote to the committee chairman, saying, you have knowingly associated yourself with one who has openly denied the eternal Godhead of our Lord and the inspiration of the Word. The whole controversy led to an uproar against having a Unitarian involved at Westminster Abbey. Bergen was supported by the protest of thousands of other ministers, including Henry P. Lydon, a prominent theologian of the time. In a letter to Dean Bergen, he revealed that having an unbeliever handle the Word of God was by no means an acceptable standard among Reformed Protestants. He said, But alas, what apology can be suggested for the churchman who invited a man who has spent his life in denying the Godhead of our blessed Savior? When, since the Reformation, has the faith of our church been more cruelly wounded? How can we ever approach this translation but as an object of legitimate, inevitable suspicion. How many passengers will at once occur in which we shall expect to trace the hand of heresy? Bergen called the inclusion of a Unitarian minister 
an insult to our divine master and a wrong to the church, that the pure word of God should have been thus handled. Dr. Ian Paisley, when writing about the controversy of Westcott and Hort, said that, so dishonest was their behavior that Charles Wordsworth, Bishop of St. Andrews, refused to sign his name to a testimonial of thanks to the chairman. Looking back on the translation, the bishop called it a deplorable failure. When we're talking about Westcott and Hort, uh, they, they just weren't uh, staunch believers in the scriptures, Chris. Uh, they didn't have a high view of scripture. They didn't believe the, in the verbal plenary inspiration of the scriptures. And so uh, you cannot have a corrupt root um, without having corrupt fruit. The importance of receiving the New Testament as the Word of God has been acknowledged since ancient times. The Apostle Paul wrote to the early church, saying, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the Word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the Word of men, but as it is in truth the Word of God. Yet modern critical scholars do not handle the Bible necessarily as if it were the Word of God, but often think the Bible should be treated as any other historic or religious book, such as the Koran. The Koran and the New Testament are both ancient documents that were transmitted to us and have a textual history, and you have to use the same standard in the analysis of the one that you use in the analysis of the other. Dr. White's comment is, again, based on the idea that recovering the history of the Bible is like mathematics, something that can be done in a purely scientific manner without the requirement of faith or spiritual guidance from God. Yes, I am saying that a non-Christian could understand the history of the Bible, of course. If I say otherwise, I have to become a Gnostic. I have to say that there's some kind of, of spiritual knowledge, and what that does is it removes the Bible from the realm of history. Yet the question remains, which history of the Bible should be embraced? The history that was understood by the Reformers and men like Dr. Scribner and Dean Bergen, or the speculative history based on the theory of Westcott and Hort? Those who oppose the origins of the critical text argue that the faith of Christ was delivered unto the saints and not the scholars and critics. Therefore, it should be saints who handle the word of God. The scripture says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, saying, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Joining Kurt Olland and Bruce Metzger in their work was a Roman Catholic Jesuit priest named Carlo Maria Martini. Carlo Maria Martini was definitely a scholar, and he was most definitely a Jesuit from childhood. He was the perfect man for the Pope to suggest to work with the Protestants in those joint Greek projects, the creation of a Greek text. The Vatican website tells us that Martini was the only Catholic member of the ecumenical committee that prepared the new Greek edition of the New Testament. The UBS, United Bible Society's 
first edition Greek text had come out about 1965-66, right there. And when it came out, immediately after that, Carla Maria Martini was called to join with them with the purpose of creating a Greek text that Catholics could also work with, number one, and they'd also feel comfortable resetting up a Latin Vulgate to match. So that if you look at their new, or Nuova Vulgata, New Latin Vulgate, and the United Bible Society's third edition Greek text, they're virtually the same. Martini's involvement was apparently intended to end a conflict between the Greek and Latin texts that can be dated back to the time of Erasmus, who published his New Testament in both Greek and Latin, as we learn at Erasmus House in Brussels. Two different texts. One is the version, version of the, the Greek text, and at the right, the column with the Latin text. It was revolutionary for this time because the men of this time came to compare the original and the translation of Erasmus, and that modified the system of the religious thinking of this time. The modified religious thinking that the Erasmus text inspired would become the Great Reformation of the 16th century, which led to a divide between Catholics and Protestants that spanned some 300 years, during which conflicts were often resolved through war and inquisition. But by the 19th century, things began to change as Protestant scholars adopted the Vatican's Greek Bible, the Codex Vaticanus. It might be said that the modern ecumenical movement began with the influence of professing evangelical scholars such as Constantine von Tischendorf. There's no question about his connections with the Catholic Church. And it's interesting as you go on and you focus on what's happened in the last century, it is amazing the ties between Roman Catholicism and the ties between particularly the Jesuits and the evangelicals or those called evangelical, who change and impact the evangelical world. Many researchers believe that the ecumenical movement to join evangelicals with Rome is a modern manifestation of the Jesuits' counter-reformation. I think the modern ecumenical movement is a child of Rome, and I believe that the idea is to bring back now peaceably rather than by force, massacre, and war, to bring Protestantism back peaceably to the foot of the papacy. So I think the modern ecumenical movement uh, majors on education, propaganda, and those kinds of things, church unions, unity conferences, and uh, many books, pamphlets, and magazines, and conferences all meeting to promote ecumenical unity. I think that's where the Counter-Reformation uh, works today. In the 20th century, the Jesuit Carlo Martini would become one of the most influential figures in biblical scholarship and in the cause of ecumenism because of his work on the Greek New Testament. From 1966 until 2002, Martini was a member of the United Bible Society, one of the five people in the world to determine the Greek text. What a powerful position. As a result of that, he was elevated to cardinal. He was uh, given special honors. Like Westcott, Hort, Oland, and Metzger, Martini was known for his liberal theology. He was even referred to as the Pope of liberal Catholics. And until he died, even though he was way off liberal for Catholic theology, he was very useful for pulling people together in this one area, this ecumenical Bible. But Martini was just one of a number of influential Jesuits in the history of the critical text. The first was Cardinal Angelo Mai in the 19th century, who worked on the Codex Vaticanus. It was Cardinal Mai who met with Constantine von Tischendorf at the Vatican right before Tischendorf left for St. Catherine's Monastery to discover the Codex Sinaiticus. But in the 20th century, 
another Jesuit priest would play a key role in the next phase of critical text history. In the 1950s, a prominent Swiss collector named Martin Bodmer purchased a series of Egyptian manuscripts that would become known as the Bodmer Papyri. This was but one of a series of discoveries that involved recovering ancient biblical texts from the sands of Egypt. Because the papyri match some of the readings of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, some believe that they confirm the theory of Westcott and Hort, and hence refute the objections of men like Dean Bergen. My concern is any use of, of, of Bergen uh, as having relevance today outside of a historical application to analyzing the balance of Westcott and Hort. What I mean by that is this. Bergen existed and wrote before the papyri. If you consistently apply the things that Bergen himself wrote, had he had the papyri, he would have been forced to make different conclusions. But is this the case? Would Dean Bergen have abandoned or changed his theory if he had lived to see the papyri? As shown before, Dean Bergen's theory was that the strange readings found in Vaticanus and Sinaiticus were likely the result of Gnostic corruptions from the early centuries. But is there evidence that the papyri are of Gnostic origin? And could this be the reason why they confirm certain readings in the critical text? Sinaiticus and Vaticanus demonstrate the, the primitive existence of a text that goes before them to the papyri. Now, where do the papyri come from? Do the papyri many places, many places. Uh, papyri tend to be small fragments. Uh, for example, P52, the earliest papyri fragment we have right now, uh, we have no idea what its provenance is as far as to where specifically it came from. It was discovered amongst a bunch of papyri that were brought to England from Egypt. Um, so almost anywhere in Egypt, uh, we, we simply don't know. Uh, so the Bodmer papyri, the Chester Beatty papyri, uh, many within that collection have different origins and sources because so many of them are fragmentary. The Egyptian papyri that pertain to the New Testament generally fall into three categories. The first was unearthed by two explorers named Bernard Grenfeld and Arthur S. Hunt. Grenfeld and Hunt discovered a whole collection of papyri that were buried in an ancient rubbish dump near Oxyrhynchus in Egypt. The collection is called the Oxyrhynchus papyri, some of which supports the critical text. For example, among the many fragments was found Unseal 0162, which is said to be very close to the readings of Codex Vaticanus. Yet this is only one example among the various collections of papyri. The readings that they share in common uh, are not radically changed readings from uh, even the Byzantine text or anything like that. Uh, but the readings that they share in common demonstrate that there is a direct connection between the exemplars that was used for Sinaiticus and for Vaticanus and the period of the papyri themselves. That is the key historical issue. That's where the connection is. Yet among the Oxyrhynchus remains were also found fragments of other Gospels, including the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, and the Gospel of Peter, all three of Gnostic origin. There's tons of Gnostic manuscripts where they just rewrite the Bible and change it to what they want to say. So the devil was busy very early corrupting the words of God. The next collection of papyrus are known as the Chester Beatty papyri, named after their wealthy benefactor, Sir Alfred Chester Beatty. In 1931, it was published that certain manuscripts were discovered, stowed away in jars, and dug up from a Coptic graveyard in Egypt. The specific details of their origin remained a mystery because they were obtained through the black market. 
Later in the 1950s, Chester Beatty would acquire additional papyri that are said to be directly related to those of Martin Bodmer. The reason is because they were taken from the same source. Both men worked with the same antiquities dealer in Egypt, a man named Fokion J. Tano, who would become the permanent agent of Bodmer and Chester Beatty. But Tano did not work alone. Author James Robinson, in his groundbreaking book on the story of the Bodmer papyri, explains how Tano worked alongside a Jesuit priest named Father Luis Dutrelo. We read that Father Luis Dutrelo, S.J., for the Society of Jesus, worked in Cairo in the 1950s, during which time he served as a link between Tano and the Bibliotheque Bodmer. According to Robinson's account, Tano acquired the manuscripts and papyri, while the role of Dutrelo was in giving an assessment of what Tano had to offer Bodmer for sale. In his writings, Dutrelo revealed that the papyri had come from the Nagamati region in Egypt. In this same region, another collection of manuscripts had been discovered a decade earlier. In 1945 was uncovered the Nagamati Library, which was a collection of Gnostic writings containing over 50 Gnostic Gospels and texts, including the Gospel of Thomas and, incredibly, another work titled The Gospel of Truth. The so-called Gospel of Truth was specifically mentioned by Irenaeus in the 2nd century, who claimed it had been created by the followers of a Gnostic teacher named Valentinus, along with other false Gospels. Irenaeus wrote, They entitle their recent composition The Gospel of Truth, though it agrees in nothing with the Gospels of the Apostles, and so no Gospel of theirs is free from blasphemy. Yet according to Dutrelo, it was not far from this Gnostic library that the Bodmer papyri were discovered in 1952. He wrote that, Tano spoke of two discoveries at Nagamati, one in a buried jar. This is the Gnostic manuscripts, the other in a grotto quite close to there, what has become the bulk of the Bodmer collection. Dutrelo himself referred to the two discoveries as Nagamati 1, the Gnostic manuscripts, and Nagamati 2, the Bodmer papyri. Nearly all the biblical papyri come from Egypt and are generally said to be of the Alexandrian text type, which matches the classification given to both Codex Vaticanus and the Codex Sinaiticus. The name Alexandrian is a reference to the ancient port city of Alexandria, Egypt founded by Alexander the Great in the 4th century BC. It became one of the most important cities in the ancient world, and in the early centuries was the epicenter of Gnostic teaching. According to a Coptic Orthodox website, the most important center of Gnosticism was Alexandria. It was in Alexandria that the greatest doctors of Gnosticism, Basilides, Carpocrates, and Valentinus flourished. Athanasius frequently refers to them, as well as to Marcion, warning of their danger to Christian doctrine. It's always been stated that Vaticanus and Sinaiticus have their origin in Alexandria, Egypt. Bruce Metzger uh, in one of his books outlines the terrific corruption that came out of Alexandria that came out of Egypt. And in one of his books he really belabors the point. He mentions all of the heretical cults and sects that came out of that area. The history of Gnosticism in Alexandria and its association with the Egyptian papyri is significant because key portions of these collections are said to support the readings of the critical text. Perhaps most significant 
is Bodmer Papyrus 75, also known as P75, which is said to be in great agreement with the Codex Vaticanus. Lots of studies have been done of the relationship of P75 with Codex Vaticanus. And it's been demonstrated that while they are genealogically related, um, Vaticanus is not a copy of P75, and both of them are going back to an earlier copy before them that descended down to them. Yet Dr. White's description seems to confirm the view of men like Dean Bergen. Bergen argued that there were different Gnostic groups that each held to their own peculiar doctrines and that they altered the books of the New Testament based upon their own individual ideas, resulting in inconsistent patterns of corruption. Bergen wrote that, Besides Marcion's lacerated text of St. Luke's Gospel, there was a Nevianite recension of St. Matthew. Also, there was a Cerinthian exhibition of St. Mark and a Valentinian perversion of St. John. These professors of Gnosticism held no consistent theory. The proneness of these early heretics severally to adopt one of the four Gospels for their own explains why there is no consistency observable in the corruptions they introduced into the text. The Egyptian papyri are often said to be of mixed text types, meaning that they do not follow any consistent pattern. In this regard, they seem to match the character of Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus that are said to disagree in some 3,000 places in the New Testament alone. If Dean Bergen had lived to see the papyri, would he have changed his view, as Dr. White suggests, or would the papyri only provide confirmation that the peculiar readings of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus and the critical text are in fact the result of Gnostic heresies? Yes, Bergen was right. As soon as the living word was taken to heaven, Satan turned all of his wrath upon the written word. Uh, there was a battle. There was a battle, but there was a winner. And when you look at all of the evidence and see, yet, yes, from the very beginning, there was an attack upon the doctrinal heart of Scripture. In the papyri, they just about succeeded in pulling it out. The view of scholars who defend the traditional Greek text is that the battle from the early centuries over the New Testament was ultimately won by the saints who believed the true faith of Christ and who separated the pure words of God from the Gnostic influence. This is what Dean Bergen meant when he referred to the fabricated readings which the church has long since rejected with abhorrence. Dr. Wilbur Pickering documents a study that involved comparing some of the key papyri with the leading critical text codices and showed a range of variation in excess of 30%. As a result, the New Greek Testament is typically called an eclectic text. Well, the only reason why they have to say that is because there's so much disagreement. And frequently, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaic disagree with each other. And then some of their favored papyri disagree. So because of this disagreement, rather than go to the traditional text, which has this harmony, which is unified, which has just enough slight difference to let you know that the thousands of manuscripts that support it are independent productions, not lateral copies of each other. Uh, but rather than go to that, now they've got 7% of the manuscripts radically disagreeing with each other, but frequently united in their 
opposition to the received text manuscripts. The contrast is sometimes presented in the following way. There are more than 5,000 Greek manuscripts that support the readings of the received text. These are said to be in agreement more than 99% of the time. On the other side are some 45 critical text manuscripts, largely from Egypt, that disagree approximately 30% of the time. There's the pure line and the corrupt line, and they're made up of all different kinds of corruptions, and their corruptions don't agree with each other. It might be argued that the inclusion of this corrupt line of manuscripts, along with the Westcott and Hort theory, is what leads people to believe that the Bible has been rewritten so many times that no one truly knows what it says. The reason is because as new papyri are discovered, modern textual critics have continually made changes based on whatever new theory emerges, resulting in some 28 editions of the Nessel Oland Greek text. As Dr. Pickering tells us, hence no part of the text is safe. A new papyrus may come to light tomorrow with new variants to challenge the unanimous witness of the rest. The theory of Dr. Hort, preferring minority readings over those of the majority text, has been a continual source of conflict and debate. 19th century Scottish minister William Garden Blakey defined his opposition to the Westcott and Hort theory. He said, What we contend for is not the printed text of the 16th century, but the text received by the whole of Christendom after the churches rested from persecution. When there was time to exchange thought and knowledge and the men were not forced to conceal the sacred books, the text which has the widest, the most authoritative and the most varied attestation is what we ask for. That this happens to be also the dominant text of the fourth century AD and that it is identical to a very considerable extent with the Textus Receptus Dr. Hort himself asserts. Blakey went on to confront the illogical nature of Hort's argument in that it rejected the great majority of all biblical manuscripts. He commented that, In the multitude of counselors there is safety, according to Solomon. In the multitude of witnesses there is falsehood, according to Dr. Hort. The Jesuit Luis Dutrelo was not only involved in the discovery of the Bodmer papyri, but was an active member of a group in France known as Sources Chrétiennes, or Christian Sources. The group was co-founded by two other Jesuits named Henry Lebac and Jean Danelot. Both men would become renowned for their involvement in Vatican Council II in the 1960s. The historic ecumenical council, Vatican II, comes to a close amid colorful pomp and pageantry. Considered one of the most important councils in Catholic Church history, Vatican II saw 2,400 bishops and other prelates revise many aspects of church activity. Vatican II is also known as the ecumenical council and dramatically altered the view of the Catholic Church towards other beliefs, including Protestantism. Vatican II was the first time the Roman Catholic Church openly changed their strategy. They presented themselves as, we're all brothers in Christ. Yeah, we have some differences, but we can iron them out. So they changed their entire strategy from persecutor to separated brother. Vatican II specifically addressed the issue of Bible translations involving Catholics and Protestants something promoted by the Jesuit order. Well, they obviously had a huge part in Vatican II. It was a Jesuit who actually wrote the section that said we will work with the separated brethren on Bible translation it was actually written by a Jesuit. The work in question was called De Verbum, Latin for the Word of God. This section of Vatican II came under the influence of a Jesuit cardinal named Augustine Bea. Cardinal Bea 
then employed the writings of another Jesuit named Walter Abbott. The Jesuit Walter Abbott was an editor for America magazine, a Jesuit magazine produced in the United States. In 1959, he wrote a simple little article called The Bible as a Bond, something to bond Protestants and Catholics together. The idea was that we could all get along in joint Bible translation projects and in joint projects to create the Greek and Hebrew text. A number of Protestants were also in attendance at Vatican Council II. One of them was David Duplessis, the man known as Mr. Pentecost. According to his own testimony, Duplessis had been sent there by one of the most important figures in the modern history of the Bible, William Cameron Townsend, the founder of Wycliffe Bible Translators. Also known as Uncle Cam, Townsend was dedicated to translating Bibles into the remote languages of people around the world. By his own admission, to accomplish his aim, he employed ecumenical methods. In his biography, Uncle Cam, he is quoted saying, since we are non-sectarian and non-ecclesiastical, we get help from Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, and even atheists. Working on an old abandoned farm in Arkansas, Townsend also founded another group known as the Summer Institute of Linguistics, or SIL. Anybody who wants to become a Bible translator with Wycliffe, or with SIL, or with any Bible translation agency has to go through SIL. Everybody in the world is pretty much funneled into the Summer Institute of Linguistics. That's where you get the principles by which you're supposed to learn Bible translation. Go into a culture, listen to it, hear the way the language is presented, create a writing system, a sound system first, then learn the rules of the language, create a writing system because they're preliterate, teach it back to them, then in that process create a Bible for them, and then teach it back to them, and teach them to read their own language. So SIL is this means to do this. Author David Daniels is a graduate of Fuller Theological Seminary. Years ago, he along with wife Debbie sought out training through SIL. I went there for three summers. Everybody goes there for three summers. In our first summer at SIL, um, both Debbie and I split off into different directions on weekends. One Saturday, I went up into the mountains with one of our professors. He'd been a missionary Bible translator for many years. When we got up in the mountains, I listened to what he said, and as I was listening, a thought came to mind to ask him, and I said, basically, I said, do you believe the story about Noah, the great flood, and all that? And he looked at me and he said, no, David, but look, when you go to raise your missionary support, they have all these statements of faith for you to sign. It doesn't matter what you believe. Just sign them. When you get on the mission field, you can do whatever you want. I just spent that morning looking at the beautiful creation and thinking, wow, I want to honor God and thank Him always, like it says in Romans chapter 1. And I was so excited about the day, I really wanted to hear something different from Him than that. What it told me was a number of really important things. Number one, this guy had no problem lying to churches raising missionary support. Two, he didn't believe the Bible he was translating. Three, he raised a family on the mission field. Four, does this mean that he intended me not to believe the Bible, to sign a statement of faith saying I did, to go on the field, to learn a language, to create a writing system for him, translate a Bible I didn't believe for them, and to do this on a clean conscience? How did this guy become an SIL translator? What is going on that a non-believer is a translator? And it started to make me wonder, who else is not a believer who's an SIL translator? What am I going to find on the mission field? And what do they expect me to do? One of the most important members of SIL who worked with Cam Townsend was Eugene Albert Nida. 
who would dramatically alter the methods of Bible translation and greatly further ecumenical relations with Rome. This goes back again, Eugene Nida meeting as early as 1954 with representatives of the Catholic Church, talking about building bridges so that you could do translation work together, several official meetings along the way, the Pope and the Vatican and the Cardinals endorsing the idea in Vatican II, saying it's all right to work with the separated brethren. We weren't even called heretics in that point. You know, we're just separated brethren. You can work with the separated brethren to produce Bible translations. And again, the, the champion of this, they were so excited with his approach to this, they asked Eugene Nida to come to the Jesuit school in Rome and teach Bible translation. Eugene Nida was the most significant man for Bible translation in the 20th century. He was that guy that created this so-called science of Bible translating in which they thought that they were bypassing all the groups. The translators themselves were told, well, this isn't denominational, it's not even Catholic. Anybody can use this Bible because it's just the Word of God translated scientifically. Nida worked for years with SIL and Wycliffe Bible translators. But in 1953, there was a parting of the ways during a time of conflict within the organization over the subject of the inerrancy of Scripture. Some believe it was this issue that brought about Nida's resignation. I believe one of the reasons that he left Wycliffe and Summer Institute of Linguistics, though he still uh, continued on uh, working with them, but he left his position, was that he couldn't um, sign the doctrinal statement. This is my personal belief that he couldn't sign the doctrinal statement. He got uncomfortable because when he first started, the people who were in the leadership didn't have to sign the doctrinal statement that said you believe uh, that the scripture was the word of God in the original writings. But in 1953, the same year NIDA resigned, all members were required to sign the statement. The issue created what can only be called a complex controversy at Wycliffe and SIL. In 1955, Cameron Townsend complained that he wished the theory of inspiration had never arisen in the first place. Despite these conflicts, the work of Eugene Nida was just beginning. What happened was, as he left there, and with the recommendation of some people from Wycliffe, he goes to the American Bible Society uh, and starts being their chief of translators. So they send him to places, and what does he do? He tells the translators, you gotta quit translating literally. Based on his theories about language, Nida engineered a new system for developing modern Bibles. Eugene Nida was the champion of what became known as dynamic equivalency. And this is a method of translation, a new method of translation that's based on a new doctrine. Prior to Nida, people at least gave lip service to the idea that God had inspired the words. And so when you're translating from one language to another, your job is to take the words that God gave in Greek and Hebrew and turn them into that language, the equivalent of those words in the next language. But Nida was a big backer of the idea of concept inspiration, that God didn't inspire words, he inspired ideas. So Nida taught that instead of translating the words, we need to figure the ideas behind the words, translate those ideas into the words in that language. Nida argued that those whose tendency was to translate the Bible word for word, were guilty of worshiping words more than worshiping God. He said, I decided that we've got to approach the scripture as though it is the message and try to give its meaning, not just to repeat the words. So they said, well, we're, we're just taking the meaning. Well, you're taking your interpretation of the meaning. Real Bible translation translates the words God gave, and then you and I have to figure out how to interpret them. And we may have differences as we come to that, but the words are the authority. Now the ideas. Well, who decides what the ideas behind those words were? Nida had gotten influenced by a doctrine called neo-orthodoxy. Eh, funny sounding word, but what it really means is that the scriptures are not inspired. The scriptures inspire the reader. As he said it, one way of summarizing it is the scriptures are inspired because they inspire me. 
So what he believed sometime in his college years, and I don't know exactly where it happened, but he started to believe that if you could invoke the same feeling in a reader of a different culture, of what he alleges that the original Bible reader felt, that that's inspiration. Knight's teachings also had a profound impact on another man named Kenneth L. Pike, who had become the president of SIL and a leading international figure in linguistics. Ken Pike was a strong Bible believer at one point. Way, way back in 1936, 37, he himself believed that NIDA had gone the wrong direction. Ken Pike wrote to his superiors these words, the territory of the devil staked a claim and has left a boy in bondage. But after that, NIDA pulled Ken Pike into this whole concept of linguistics and science and all that. And by the time he got his doctorate, he became a thoroughgoing believer in Bible doubting to the point that as he saw the development of Eugene Nida over the years, he wrote, Nida has made the one greatest contribution to Bible translation of recent times. And then he said, he has taken over literal word for word translation and smashed it. After his death in 2011, Christianity Today declared that Eugene Nida's influence can be found in most Christian homes, more specifically in their Bibles. His dynamic equivalence approach is used by many modern versions. In addition to convincing translators to abandon word-for-word -word translation, Nida, along with Cam Townsend, also played an important role in advancing ecumenical relations with Rome in accordance with the ideas of Vatican II. Along with Catholic prelates, there are a hundred observers from other faiths. It was Nida who helped to organize the Committee of Scholars that put together the United Bible Society's Greek New Testament. In a rare photo, Nida is pictured here beside the Jesuit Carlo Martini. It was Martini who invited Nida to teach his methods at a Jesuit university in Rome. Eugene Nida was invited starting in 1971 every year to come for a number of weeks to teach a whole class in translation to Jesuits. He is invited to be the adjunct professor at the Jesuit Pontifical Bible Institute in Rome. The same man training the Protestant translators goes to the Pontifical Institute of the Jesuits and trains the students there in translation. One day, Nida himself relates in his autobiography, he was approached by a Jesuit at the Pontifical Biblical Institute and said, you are doing the most important thing to happen since the Reformation. That should have raised a red flag. If a Jesuit comes to you and says, you've done the most important thing since the Reformation, the thing you should really ask yourself is what have I done wrong? The NIDA Institute for Biblical Scholarship continues today through the American Bible Society. A representative from NIDA's Institute also teaches every year at the Jesuit University in Rome. But those concerned about the ecumenical methods of Bible translating question the results, since the process involves making sure others are not offended by the translation. But what do you have to do to a Bible to get everybody to approve of it? An example of ecumenical compromise is the Revised Standard Version of 1952. The Old Testament Committee included an unbelieving Jewish scholar, Harry Orlinsky, whose involvement caused an uproar over the book of Isaiah. So when you come to Isaiah 714, when it talks about a virgin shall be with child, and Matthew the Apostle, under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, translates it straightforward as virgin, well, this Jewish translator doesn't want it to say virgin, so it just says young woman. That was the beginning. What was amazing is Ken Pike, uh, who was the head of SIL at the time, said this was wonderful, that he had seen 
these liberal translators did a much better job of translating than conservative translators that he'd known. The ecumenical movement that began with Vatican Council II has spread throughout the world and is often driven by unification efforts surrounding the Bible. Even the museum dedicated to the memory of William Tyndale in Brussels now offers an ecumenical Bible. Yes, this is uh, the new last Bible that is uh, used also by the Catholics, also as the Protestants. And who they were this? together, uh, produced by the Bible in, uh, in Holland. The United uh, Bible Societies? Yeah, United yeah. Bible Society. And in, did, did the in Catholics Japan. and Protestants work together on this? Yes, yes, certainly. Now, the Vatican has been, because of Eugene Nida, in an official agreement with the United Bible Society since 1967. Is that true? Yes. And it, was uno it started before then, unofficially, but there was an official agreement from that point on. And by 1979, the official Greek text of the Roman Catholic Church was the United Bible Society's text, which meant that uh, you had a one-world Greek text, except for a handful of us, you know, that aren't signed into the program, but they would present it as the one-world Greek text that everybody agrees, agrees upon. So the Roman Catholics, the United Bible Society, the American Bible Society, almost every national Bible society around the world agrees on the same Greek text, the same Hebrew text for translation. So from 1979 on, we've had a, a one world Bible officially approved by the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope in Greek and Hebrew. And so the new translations that stem from that are going to have great consistency regardless of what language they're in. So I know folks are talking about, boy, we're heading towards a one world Bible. We're not heading towards one. We've had one since 1979. Some believe the concept of a one world Bible is part of the Jesuits' plan to eventually unite mankind under a single world religion. See, the Jesuits kept on doing one more thing to get the Catholic side open to the Protestants. And they always put the most intellectual, the most affable people in those positions. They're winsome. You want to be around them. You wouldn't mind sharing a dinner and hanging with them. That's the kind of person that the Jesuit is. The Jesuits were the cement and the grease and whatever else it took, including the dirty tricks, to make one world Bible for one world religion. Perhaps the most dramatic episode of the New Bible Movement has been the testimony of Dr. Frank Logsdon, a former pastor of the Moody Church in Chicago in the 1950s. Logsdon influenced the development of the New American Standard Bible. He had advised his friend Dewey Lockman in pursuing the translation, but came to regret it later on. His testimony was recorded prior to his death in 1987. We started on a feasibility report, and I encouraged him to go ahead with it. I'm afraid I'm in trouble with the Lord. I encouraged him to go ahead with it. We, we, we laid the groundwork. I wrote the format. I, I helped to interview some of the translators. I sat with the translators. I wrote the preface. When you see the New American Standard, they're my words. Well, when I got my copy, I mean, I, I never really looked at it. I just took for granted it was done as we started it, you know, until some of my friends across the country began to learn that I had some part in it, and they started saying, what about this? What about this? What about this? You had part in it. What, what about this? What about this? I got the place, I said to Anne, I'm in trouble. I can't refute these arguments. They're, it's wrong. It's terribly wrong. It is frightfully wrong. And what am I going to do about it? Well, I went through hard search, uh, some real soul searching for about 
four months, I don't know, I think about four months, and I sat down and wrote the most difficult letter of my life, I think. And I wrote to my friend Dewey, and I said, Dewey, I can no longer ignore these criticisms I'm hearing, and I can't refute them. The only thing I can do, and dear brother, I have nothing against you, and I can witness at the judgment seat of Christ, and before men were ever go, that you were 100% sincere. He's not schooled in language or anything. He's just a businessman. He did the promoting. He had the money. He did the promoting. So I, I said, he did it conscientiously. He wanted absolutely right. He thought it was right. But nevertheless, I said, I must, under God, renounce every attachment to the new American standard. Logsdon believed that the translation itself had been done earnestly, but that the real problem was with the underlying Greek text that could be traced to Westcott and Hort. Well, up till that time, I thought the Westcott and Hort was the text. You're, you're, you're intelligent if you believe in the Westcott and Hort. Some of the finest people in the world believe in, in that Greek text. They're the finest leaders we have today. You'd be surprised. If I told you, you wouldn't believe it. They haven't gone into it just as I hadn't gone into it, just taking for granted. Yet Logsdon learned of the secrecy practiced by Westcott and Hort and their duplicity in replacing the received text with a text of their own. And uh, they pledged, had those men pledge themselves to secrecy that they wouldn't tell anybody about the text they were using until after the book was out. Pray to guess that they would be curbed, that the King of England or somebody would prevent them. Twice British royalty refused to have anything to do with the 1881 revision. But at any rate, it was deception, see, to begin with. Their own text hadn't even been published yet, hadn't, uh, hadn't stood the scrutiny of the public. So the 1881 was built upon that. Logsdon went on to express his confidence in the scholarship and faith of the translators behind the authorized version. There, there are places where I believe the Spirit of God led the translators of the authorized version. And you read their biographies. They were mighty men of God, spent as much as five hours a day in prayer. And, and some of them knew twenty-some languages. And as before modernism filled the air, and before they were, their, their attention was diverted by so many other things, television and, and, and so on, they, they were men of God. Perhaps most disturbing. Logsdon believed that the members of the Jesuit order had been working to undermine the received text from the beginning. He even went so far as to state that this was one of the primary reasons the company had been founded by Ignatius Loyola. You know why the Jesuit, one of the main reasons why the Jesuits came into being under Ignatius Loyola, their, their main project was to supplant the Erasmus text, get it out of the way somehow, just undermine it. Uh, they said, in order to supplant the Erasmus text, we'll put our men in Protestant, send them to Protestant seminaries, Protestant Bible schools. We'll get them in teaching positions in seminaries. We'll get them in pulpits of churches, and I'm sure there's some in pulpits of uh, churches. To do what? The whole aim around the world is to destroy the Erasmus text, and this, of course, came, the authorized version came, the Erasmus text. In centuries past, the saints battled against the treachery and bloodshed of Rome and her counter-reformation. But at the heart of the conflict was an assault on the Bible as the inerrant Word of God. Some believe the attack was manifest in the work of Westcott and Hort. Yet in modern times, there are conservative teachers who defend the critical theory and still profess to believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. The quote-unquote modern critical theory, uh, which I hold to, I hold to as an inerrantist. Yet with all the contradictions in the critical text, is such a view consistent? Or does it lead to an indefensible conclusion? Dr. Daniel B. Wallace of Dallas Theological Seminary is sometimes called a modern-day Tischendorf. 
and is considered one of the leading conservative defenders of the New Testament. Yet in an article titled, 15 Myths About Bible Translation, Dr. Wallace states that it is a myth that the Bible records the exact words of Jesus Christ. He says, scholars are not sure of the exact words of Jesus. Ancient historians were concerned to get the gist of what someone said, but not necessarily the exact wording. In truth, though red letter editions of the Bible may give comfort to believers that they have the very words of Jesus in every instance, this is a false comfort. If Dr. Wallace is correct and the New Testament does not contain the exact words of Jesus, then how can Christians defend the specific teachings of Christ? Jesus said, And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. But how can a man be held accountable for the words of Jesus Christ if he has no way of being sure exactly what they are? Yet in the New Testament, the promise to preserve the words of Christ was given to the apostles. Jesus said, The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Commenting on the scripture, Dean John Bergen said, Before our Lord ascended up to heaven, he told his disciples that he would send them the Holy Ghost, who should supply his place and abide with his church forever. He added a promise that it should be the office of that inspiring spirit not only to bring to their remembrance all things whatsoever he had told them, but also to guide his church into all the truth I am utterly unable to believe, in short, that God's promise has so entirely failed that at the end of 1,800 years, much of the text of the Gospel had in point of fact to be picked by a German critic out of a waste paper basket in the convent of St. Catherine, and that the entire text had to be remodeled after the patterns set by a couple of copies which had remained in neglect during 15 centuries. Like Dean Bergen, many modern defenders of the traditional text agree that the promise of God has not failed. But the question remains, was the critical text developed as a more pure version of the scripture? Or for the purpose of systematically destroying faith in the Bible so that mankind might one day be united in a one world religion and governed by that person known in the scripture as the man of sin?